Welcome to episode 2A of Saying Something Sober, the podcast where I decide the topic and it could be literally anything. Today's episode will be a two-parter. Today's topic is The Velvet Rage by Alan Downs, overcoming the pain of growing up gay in a straight man's world. Velvet Rage is a book that I just read And it essentially talks about toxic shame and the difficulties experienced by specifically gay men uh, in relation to their feelings about their sexuality and, and kind of inferiority. He says on page four, the goal of this book is to help gay men achieve this third stage of authenticity. It is my experience that gay men who are not ready to or willing to work toward this goal have a difficult time acknowledging their shame and the radical effects of it on their lives. Until a gay man is ready to re-examine his life, he may not be able to realise the undercurrent of shame that has carried him into a life that often isn't very fulfilling. I was highly recommended to read this book ever since I started sobriety, and essentially in it he splits shame and overcoming shame into three stages and then gives kind of life advice and, and life lessons. So what I'll do is I'll go through the the stages and I'll go through the lessons at the end. It won't be a comprehensive summary of the book because really my recommendation is that you go read it. But essentially, I will be giving my thoughts, how it applies to me on each element. But that comes with a heavy trigger warning. There will be talk of substance abuse, trauma, depression, suicide. So a heavy trigger warning for this episode. Now with this book, um, I must say that I think and hope that with time, um, it will become less and less relevant. Even as I read it, I could recognize that it had aged slightly. It is very much still relevant, but some of the timelines and topics um, had to be adapted slightly to fit a more modern coming-of-age gay life and a more modern gay adult lifestyle. But as a kind of brief overview of the book, Alan states, In my practice as a psychologist, this is my goal, to help gay men be gay and fulfilled. He continues, the book is arranged into a simple three-stage model that describes the journey of virtually all gay men with whom I have worked. I suspect that this model, or some modified version of it, is likely to be universal to all gay men in the Western world and perhaps across the globe. Now, he does talk specifically about gay men. He states in the introduction on page five, it must be noted that what is written here is in many ways applicable to lesbian women too. While I do work with many lesbian women and find their journey to be similar, the ways in which it is explored are often very different. So this book specifically refers to gay men. Some of it will likely be relevant to lesbian women and beyond that. But um, this book specifically refers to gay men. And also throughout this episode, I will be quoting it quite a lot. I've got kind of extracts and highlights that I've pulled out in relation to my reading and how I've applied it to myself. Um, So I will be kind of reading extracts as I go. But like I said, big trigger warning for this episode. Um, I'll be going through the three stages, then his kind of three pillars of authentic validation, some questions to ask yourself that I've noted down that he mentions, and then lastly, kind of life lessons and mantras that he, he lists out as well. Alan Downs is a clinical psychologist practicing in Beverly Hills, California, um, and he characterizes stage one as the avoidance of shame. And he says that the avoidance of shame comes a single most powerful driving force in a gay man's life. And it's mostly characterized by inhibiting your emotions. So he says inhibited emotions are those feelings that we successfully avoid and therefore don't feel. And that inhibited emotions, especially rage and shame, are a major problem for gay men. 
We don't feel the shame and rage, so we aren't aware how significantly these emotions are affecting and influencing our lives. The truth is that the avoidance of shame and rage, as much as the actual experiencing of these emotions, troubles us. And obviously, this is something that is hugely relatable as a gay man. I think for the longest time growing up, I thought that I didn't really feel emotions that strongly. That was quite a emotionless person. But as I kind of traversed through this sobriety journey, I'm kind of unpacking all of, all of that and trying to experience things more prominently or trying to experience things more presently like I'm more present in the in the moment but Down says that stage one um one of the key things that kind of occurs is this crash and lash syndrome which is this hypersensitivity to invalidation which is an increased rage like reaction to invalidation so stage one is this avoiding shame um, and so we do anything to kind of avoid feeling invalidated and kind of when we do feel invalidated there's a, such a quick reaction and this is i mean i've witnessed this in friends in school i've witnessed it definitely in myself i'm not sure that my reaction is rage as it is more kind of retreating within myself i think i was growing up i was never no one ever knew the full story it was all kind of bits and pieces and there were so many things i didn't tell people stupid things i didn't tell people that i kept to myself because i was ashamed you know i didn't tell people that i liked playing video games because i thought that that would make me seem too nerdy i didn't obviously didn't tell people I was gay but another thing that Alan Downs characterizes in stage one is splitting which is this idea that there's multiple versions of ourselves that we present to the world and we split our lives into kind of different people in order to kind of control the narrative um and most definitely that's relevant to me I mean to my friends I was one to my parents I was another even after coming out and kind of as I reconcile now there was kind of three versions of myself that I was living there was the one that my parents knew which was kind of this young professional in London who was doing well succeeding with friends going out quite a lot there was the one with my friends which was like this fun chaotic person who liked to go out a lot and was doing all right at work and then there was like the third one which was the one that was doing stuff without my friends and going too hard and too long and continuing the night when I didn't need to. But Alan Down says, when we target our rage at the, on those around us, we inevitably push them away, creating an environment of mistrust and confusion in our relationships. When we focus our rage internally, we do even greater damage. Internalized rage manifests in self-defeating patterns of behavior. behavior. Substance abuse, reckless disregard for safe sex and HIV, financial responsibility, career dropout, and repeatedly destroying the opportunities for success that come our way. I think internal rage or internal self harm is, is definitely something that I witness and I've experienced. I think when you go out so much the next day and even the next few days, are spent kind of beating yourself up about what you did and how long you did it and why you did it and you don't have the time to focus on yourself you're so much more thinking about what you did the past the past few days what why you did it but when it comes to splitting you'll have to keep up the illusion to all the other people so you might have the life with your parents that You've got plans and so you've got to put to bed all of this stuff that happened on Sunday so that you can be the one, the person that your parents know on Monday. And that's definitely something that I've done. And even now, still to some extent do. I know eventually I want to and will kind of consolidate all these 
different versions of me into one, but that comes with a lot of other difficult conversations, I suppose. I mean, he mentions substance abuse in the book a lot, and obviously that's relevant. Saying something sober is a podcast where I say something sober because I'm sober. So obviously substance abuse is prevalent in the gay community and way more prevalent than I think people realize. Everyone knows drugs are a problem, but no one kind of really can conceptualize how insidious it is in the gay community. I mean, every given Sunday, there are countless flats where countless number of gay men are still going probably from Friday night. So yeah, substance abuse is, is heavily relevant and prevalent. But throughout the book, uh, Alan uses stories from patients that he's worked with to contextualize what he's talking about. And a lot of these are quite hard to read. Some are actually quite positive, but a lot of them are used in a way to contextualize these concepts that he's kind of coining. Um, and to give an idea of like the level of which these stories get to, he talks about Mitch. So he was working with Mitch's mother and, uh, she was reporting that Mitch had become impossible with his family and that any slightest comment or criticism led to him reacting with this rage, which is this crash and lash syndrome, right? He's receiving a validation and reacting instantly. And I've definitely done this with my family. Uh, there was a time not too long ago, we were playing a card game and I felt like they were purposefully using the rules to try and annoy me things that didn't really matter like who dealt the cards and they were trying to do it to to rile me up and it you know it riled me up and i remember just that whole night being very angry and not saying much i'm not someone that kind of shouts when i get angry i more just retreat inwards but you know still anger but in the story that he talks about mitch he says in the year that followed, I saw Mitch's mother occasionally as she needed to talk over her concerns about the family. During that year, Mitch continued to spin out of control. When he lost his job at one of the local high-tech plants, he drove his car to the Bay Bridge that connects Oakland with San Francisco and jumped off. Inside the car, he left a note that read, in part, I'd rather be dead than be gay. Obviously, an extremely tragic story and all the more tragic by the fact that he was a twin and his brother was gay and he was supposedly straight and it kind of just contextualizes and makes you realize the the weight and the gravity of 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 stage one in the book alan talks about stage one as kind of loosely being before and around coming out in a more modern sense, I think for me at least stage one definitely progresses beyond coming out. I came out when I was 19. The whole process of coming out took about a year and a half. My parents were the last people I told. They kind of already knew there wasn't really any bad reactions. I was outed to my sister by her ex-boyfriend, but on the whole, people responded positively. But in terms of avoiding shame and, and splitting and crash and lash syndrome and being overwhelmed by shame, um, that definitely continued on for at least a couple of year, years. And I still recognize some of the behaviors of stage one in myself today. Um, but I think I'm putting in efforts to at least refrain, refrain from it. Alan says, when a gay man is in denial of his sexuality, it is often very perplexing to those around him. Whether or not his family and friends have figured out that he is gay, they are confused, even dumbfounded, by the odd inconsistencies in his behaviour. He may become suddenly depressed and sullen and speak momentarily of dark secrets that haunt him, 
without revealing the content of those secrets. This is kind of indicative of a little bit of the aging of this book, I think, that the way it talks about dark secrets that haunt him, I, I think being gay is is quite it's in the cultural zeitgeist of the world enough now that people will probably be able to figure it out if you talk about like dark secrets and you've never had a girlfriend. But I think it's still relevant what he's saying in that your behavior as someone in the closet is inconsistent. You'll do anything to hide it. I mean, for me, I figured out I was gay when I was 12 and I've crossed the seven years it took me to come out. I went through a whole process of, I grew up Catholic, so went through a whole process of feeling that I was actually sinning and that I was going to hell, feeling that God was looking down on me. Then kind of overcoming that and realizing that it didn't matter, still feeling like God was there, but that I was just going to pretend to be straight. It didn't matter that I was gay. I was just going to pretend to be straight, marry a woman. As long as I didn't act on it, it was fine. And then overcoming that and realizing that's never going to work. It's never going to happen. Um, a long story short, finally being able to tell myself in the mirror I was gay, which took like five years and then deciding to come out. And over this process, I think people definitely recognize shifts, big shifts in my behavior. I was becoming more feminine, not femme, but allowing myself to be more myself. When I was younger, I used to control the way that I walked because I thought swaying my butt too much was gay. I wouldn't wear gap because people at school said that it stood for gay and proud. All of these things were in my head telling myself, don't do this, don't do that. You can't do this. You don't do that. And over that seven years, it took me to come out. I was unlearning it or letting it go, I guess. One says that the damaging effect of learning to live your life in two parts, whether in reality or fantasy, cannot be underestimated. It is an infectious skill that you learned, one that would eventually spread beyond the bedroom of your life. Life wasn't ever what it seemed on the surface. Nothing could be trusted for what it appeared to be. After all, you weren't what you appeared to be. In learning to hide parts of yourself, you lost the ability to trust anything or anyone fully. Without knowing it, you traded humane innocence for dry cynicism. And um, that is obviously quite a confronting statement, but I definitely can see this in myself. I think even now, because I was, I learned to almost I taught myself to be anxious about the things that I did. I taught myself to be judgmental about the things that I did. So that so much so that I now, even today, witness in my head how critical I am about my own behavior. You know, leaving a group event with friends in an Uber thinking, oh, should I have said that? That was too judgmental or should I have done this, done that? But it's weird because I'm out of the closet. So all of this stuff is, it's almost in somewhat related to my view of my self as inferior, but not directly related to being gay. Other elements that Alan characterizes as, as parts of stage one is relationship, hopelessness and traumatic romances. He states to be gay in an uncompromisingly straight world is to struggle to find love. And he talks a lot about how the first relationship that gay men enter is often a traumatic one that ends in disaster. I know a lot of friends that can relate to that and I can too. I think I had genuinely led myself to believe that I was incapable of being loved or incapable of loving after my first relationship. It was three years long and I let a lot of things slide in that relationship that I shouldn't have. I just taught myself to be okay with it because I thought that I wouldn't get any better or that this was the one you're led to believe, oh, like everyone has a soul, uh, a soul partner or, but that led me to kind of accept certain behaviors that definitely weren't okay. I think relationships can be extremely damaging and they can lead you to accept less than what you deserve. 
Alan says the darker side of stage one relationships is the overwhelming shame that clouds and penetrates this first powerful relationship. We are not free, not yet, and we struggle internally between the two defining poles of our lives, shame and love. He also talks about how relationships in gay life can be difficult to incorporate with your family. I think for me, I have this kind of jealousy of my sister's capability to introduce her boyfriend to our family and for us to kind of embrace him. There's been times where it doesn't work out and obviously she breaks up with them later down the line, but at least now she can bring her boyfriend into the fold and it can be this the celebration of, of their relationship. But what I found at least with my first boyfriend is that it was awkward that it was uncomfortable and there was certain questions that came up that I had to answer weren't there for my sister. With stage one as a whole, what I found as I was reading the book is that my mind kind of struggles to comprehend and communicate the sheer weight of everything that he's talking about. I relate a lot to it, but I almost can't fully comprehend everything all at once because it's all connected. There's so many stories that relate to everything that he's talking about that make it hard to digest. But if anyone is relating to what I'm saying, my recommendation would be to read the book because as much as I can't communicate what I felt as I read it, it was extremely helpful and guiding to read something that I related to so much, regardless of how difficult it was to concretely digest and even now verbalize. Before we move on to stage two, Alan talks a lot about relationships throughout the whole book, but talks a lot about relationships in stage one, which I have touched upon. And he kind of asks, why are gay men so affected by these early infatuations and trysts? Why do so many of us go on to fill our lives with men we can manage to forget? The relationships formed in stage one have enormous power over the gay man. And a lot of the examples and stories he talks about, they remind me or made me think of Call Me By Your Name. And I uh, wrote it down. And I have a sort of discomfort with that film and with that book. I think it is a bit of a glorification of those early relationships between gay men. I mean, obviously the age gap in it is uncomfortable, maybe not wrong, but at least uncomfortable. And so I've not seen it and I've not read it yet. I've seen people online say <laughs> that it's a gay film for straight people. And I think that that characterizes quite well why I feel so uncomfortable about it and why I've yet to see it or read it because the relationship that it is portraying is that first stage one relationship that a lot of gay men go through that is often the most trauma traumatic and often the most damaging and the one that takes forever to overcome. And at least for me, that's the case. You know, my stage one relationship that I think of now is one that has left a lot of things to be unraveled and that last scene with Timothy Chalamet that I've seen talked about where he looks into the fire, it's a romanticization of, of those feelings that I feel, of those feelings that gay men feel. And it kind of doesn't really take into account the true impact. I think the scene is complex. You know, we're looking at Timothy Chalamet crying into a fire and you're meant to put your own kind of understanding of why he's crying. Is it happy tears? Is it sad? Is it, what is it? But it doesn't really give voice to that part of all gay men that will later down the line imp 
us in regards to our first relationship. But anyway, moving on to stage two. So stage two, Alan characterizes as compensating for, for shame. Um, and it is characterized by outrageous lifestyles predominantly. So he says, there is a definite outrageous quality to our lives. Years ago, when I first took notice of this, I began asking myself why. What is it about loving another man that leads us to the outrageous? The two, in my mind, seem completely unrelated, and yet they seem to be very common partners in real life. Gay and outrageous. Yes, that more or less described many of the gay men that I knew. And I agree with Alan there. It describes a lot of the gay men that I know. It describes myself. You know, there is a reason we all, well, not all, but we move to London. We get a good paying job. We dedicate ourselves to that job, progress fast. We don't have kids, so that doesn't hold us up. We get to a, a high paying position and all the while we're partying on the weekends in fancy flats. There is a really brilliant quality about the gay community, which is that you'll always have a friend, I think. At least I've recognized it that you can go to kind of any country and find some kind of fellowship with with the gay community and because of that you make friends that live in all these different countries and probably all have these lovely flats and so you can go visit them and get free accommodation which is obviously great but i think to the outside world to the outside eye it looks like these outrageous lifestyles and that is kind of part of why we do it we want it to to look outrageous and stage two is characterized by striving for inauthentic validation so you have this inferiority complex which you've overcome being gay but you still have this feeling that you're inadequate alan says while we grow ever more comfortable with our sexuality in both public and private we have yet to deal with the core shame that continues to hound us we grew up believing that we were unacceptable and somehow tragically twisted we no longer hold that being gay is twisted, but we cling to the core belief that we are inferior. And so we're constantly looking for ways to compensate for that shame, whether it's outrageous lifestyles where we're visiting our friends in their swanky New York apartment, or we're going to fancy restaurants every weekend and we're drinking the finest champagne or our flat is adorned with the finest furniture. It's all part of stage two, trying to appear like you aren't fulfilled, you aren't filled with shame, trying to appear like your life is perfect. Alan says, in stage two, it is about trying to still the small but persistent voice of shame within us. We need validation to assure us that as gay men, we are worthwhile and ultimately deserving of love. If I'm completely honest with myself, stage two is probably where I'm at. I'm definitely on the road to stage three, which I'll obviously get to. But I think if I look back at my two years, two and a bit years in London, it's definitely where stage two progressed quite quickly. I think it was so much to do with what's the next flashiest thing that you can do and how can it be seen on your Instagram or something? And it's all related to an inferiority complex. Another element of stage two is making other people feel invalidated. Alan says, hidden in our search for validation is both a truth and a lie. The truth is that validation is good and necessary for our psychological well-being. The lie is that we have not yet truly discovered or accepted ourselves. Hence, the validation is of something less than authentic. It is the validation of a facade that we masterfully erect. And because we are so adept in knowing invalidation and striving for validation, we are very good at identifying it in others. Alan says, while no gay man is proud of it, it is true that gay men in stage two can become absolute geniuses at invalidating each other. 
if I'm entirely honest with myself. I think I can be a mean person. It's something I've noted down that to be less mean, to be less bitchy, I have to constantly remind myself of how far I've come and what I've managed to achieve and overcome and of who and where I am. But it's difficult to kind of stop myself making little jabs and comments because I've taught myself that humor is part of who I am and that's what people like about me. But sometimes pointing out people's biggest flaws as like a, a route to humor, it's not nice. It's a obvious statement, but I think gay men get stuck in this world of like that stereotype of the gay man. I had recognized this part of myself of being kind of judgmental and bitchy and, and trying to be humorous by kind of pointing out people's misgivings and missteps. I had recognized this before, but I went on a holiday with some friends over a weekend and obviously it's, it's fine to be with friends and joke about, but there was one point at which I made a joke about a friend who is older than me and I made a joke about him being old. And he pointed out to me, he said, every time you see me, you make a joke about my age. And that was it. That was the end of the conversation. But it, it really made me think because he's right. You know, he is completely right. And it really made me question whether I was being authentically myself when I did that or whether I was just trying to find a little bit of humor because if I got people laughing, then that meant they liked me. But I, I, I'm thankful that he was so upfront with me and so confronting because he didn't entertain my validation seeking and being able to contextualize something that I'd recognized about myself. And that moment has allowed me at least moving forward to, to keep that moment in mind when I'm thinking about stopping being mean. Alan says, admitting a mistake is opening the door to shame, something a gay man in stage one and two can't really afford to do, which is why I am being quite honest with myself lately, trying to be very confronting with the flaws that I perceive that I have, because I need to admit to myself those mistakes that I've made, those habits that I've allowed to grow. Because yes, that will lead me to feel shame and feel embarrassment, but stage one is characterized by avoiding it so that you don't ever feel it. So I'm so unused to feeling shame that I'll do anything to not feel it. But the only way to get used to feeling shame is to allow yourself to feel it, to open the door, to admit your mistakes. Alan talks about men, gay men in stage two who go to therapy and he says that oftentimes there's difficulty with getting them to admit their mistakes because he says what he seeks is help in avoiding shame not more exposure to shame it's not until he reaches stage three that he realizes that the only way to reduce shame is to expose oneself to it unless he's ready he will likely resist any attempt that comes close to an increasing in his experience of shame. Being unable to acknowledge mistakes of the past is often a challenge in intimate relationships. And as I said, Alan talks a lot about relationships. Um, and he says that repairing a relationship means taking a lot of those meaningful steps to accept responsibility without directing to blame. And so in my journey, I see myself in mostly in stage two with some behaviors that are indicative of stage one, but my journey, I'm trying to get to stage three. I don't see myself as there yet, but as I read this book, I'm, there are ways, there are lessons for me to take on, especially ways that I can learn to tolerate and reduce shame. Another characteristic that Alan talks about in stage two is process addiction. He uses the example of using sex to regulate your emotions. He says that men who 
use any kind of substance or sex or anything to regulate their emotions will get into this process addiction where they are unable to manage their own emotions without enacting that process. So he says, not every gay man in stages one and two develops a process addiction, but more than a few do. Ultimately, these addictions are a small leaky lifeboat in the high tide of shame. They protect, if only for the moment, the gay man from drowning in the shame that threatens to consume his life and soul. The gay man who floats in this tide must have his life lifeboat to survive. Without it, life truly isn't worth living. The height of the addiction would life be worth living if you couldn't have sex, couldn't party, couldn't get high, couldn't shop? Obviously, he's as hugely relevant as someone who is saying something sober. And a lot of that is what, I, what I'm unpacking now. Unpacking that process. I used to kind of just go out on weekends because that's what we did on weekends. Rather than stopping and asking myself, what do I want to do? And I think that process addiction of going out was just one way to manage my emotions. Whereas when I stopped, I realized I have two days at the weekend, which is a lot of time to do anything that I want to do, which is why I've taken up things like podcasting, which is why I've started having more deep, meaningful chats with friends. So I'm trying to unpack all of this baggage and learn what I can do to fix all this stuff and learn who I am and, and more about myself. There is that vicious cycle of a flavor of the month, whether that's a man, or whether it's a, a thing, a drug, anything. Lillian states, what he doesn't realize is that gay men who no longer use sex to control their emotions are often relieved to grow older. The pressure to be sexy and out on the town is lifted he no longer feels compelled to watch every calorie that passes his lips or spend seven hours a week at the gym. Instead, he is free to be himself without all that cultural expectation that he may, that he need to be something else or that he must at all costs remain alluring to other men. And this is part of another characteristic that, that Alan talks about, which is this fear of growing older. Aging for gay men is a complex issue. There's obviously generational trauma that comes with that. With the AIDS crisis in the eighties, there aren't that many older gay men around. And that's obviously something that we can comprehend and can see because there's less of them about. There is this fear of what being an older gay man means because a lot of us don't really have a model to abide by because there isn't really one. And also the gay community is so obsessed with youth and looking youthful and being beautiful that growing older is terrifying. For me, aging is, is never really been a scary one. When I started sobriety, I the age of 25, not long into sobriety. And it kind of made me realize that I was kind of just going with the motions. When I was younger, I didn't think that I'd get this far. I didn't think I'd reach 25. I definitely didn't think I'd reach 21. So I've reached an age that I almost never had plans to reach. And so I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. I'm just doing what I think is right in the moment. And growing older isn't really a scary concept for me. I think aging actually is something I look forward to. Alan also talks about two crises, one of identity and one of meaning. He asks a familiar question, is there such a thing as a healthy relationship between two men? And all of these crises and these questions come up for gay men because of this feeling of inferiority as we confront our own fear that we are not worthy. We have a crisis of, of meaning 
and of identity where we don't know who we are we don't know what life is for or why it's worth living and alan talks about the two possible outcomes foreclosure and resolution foreclosure he says is not necessarily path that won't eventually lead to resolution so foreclosure is doing something drastic or to to foreclose on this crisis changing something crazy about yourself or about your life to foreclose on this crisis to try and resolve that crisis quickly so moving to a new city changing job disappearing off the face of the earth to your friends getting a whole new friendship group all sorts of big life changes that you think will lead to the resolution of of your two crises and i think as i read this i was kind of confronted with i had been planning to move city or i'd been thinking about it i had visited washington dc and really liked it and thought if i could get a job there it'd be nice to live there for a year and as i read this i kind of thought okay that's i'm try that's me trying to foreclose on my crisis of of meaning and crisis of identity so maybe that's a plan for the future but i think whilst i'm on this journey i kind of need to stay put i don't think moving city is it going to fix anything if anything it will make things worse i've kind of grown accustomed to london as a city because i've done the crazy going out i've done the the long weekends and i I'm accustomed to how to not do that and why it's not worthwhile. Alan also talks about being gay and our outrageous lifestyles. And he says that there's no need to make it all seem better than it is. And as I conclude on my talking about stage two, I think that's something that I'm extremely guilty of. If someone asks me, how I'm doing I'm always the one to say like oh yeah fine like good like it's fine I'm always trying to make it seem better than it is rather than just being open and upfront about what I'm feeling or what I'm going through I've had a bit of a rough year to be honest the first half of the year was re really difficult really I mean I was in a headspace I never thought I'd be in and in a situation that led me to beginning sobriety that I never really pictured for myself but I have to kind of be upfront and confront it and that's what I'm trying to do I had a conversation with a friend in a pub last week and we were waiting for other friends to arrive and I asked him how he was doing and he said not good and so we talked about it for 10 minutes and he cried to me and it was nice and extremely admirable to see him be so upfront to a simple question of how are you doing and i think that made me realize how quickly i am to paint a nicer picture than it is because i don't like being emotional in front of people i will conclude stage 2 by quoting to really good quotes from alan he says men were dogs and he was hopelessly attracted to them which is iconic and also he talks about a gay man exiting stage 1 and stage 2 and he quotes he moves through life as if he were the rusty tin man awkward and clumsy slowed by the excessive weight of his leaden limbs Moving on to stage three, Alan states, resolving the crisis of meaning is all about reaching the place of honest and radical authenticity. It's about no longer needing to compensate for shame and living your life without needing to gild it with extraordinary. The one and only skill that resolves the crisis of meaning is that of acceptance. To repeat a cliche that I often breathe to myself, it is what it is. The only real meaning in life is found in being who you are right now without apologies.
You don't need to be more spiritual, richer, friendlier, better looking, younger, or living on a beach. In this moment, all you need to be is you. Only in that space will you find lasting contentment. Stage three is the final goodbye to toxic shame and the beginning of a life that is truly worth living. Earlier, obviously, I talked about how I felt that I needed to be less mean and I needed to stop using humor as a crutch. And here Alan says, oh, you don't need to be more this. You don't need to be more that. And when I say I don't, I need to be less mean, that's, I'm not talking about the same thing. I'm saying I need to be more myself and I need to not automatically revert to humor or revert to seeking validation in a quick way through humor. I need to recognize my friends as my friends and validate them in ways that they want to be validated and not invalidate them in ways that they don't want to be invalidated. And that means being more myself, being less of someone that I think people want me to be. I think people like me for my humor, so I'm a humorous person. But am I actually a humorous person? Probably a little bit, but not in the way that I typically behave. Alan says that once a gay man enters stage three, his visibility in the gay community often diminishes. And that's something that I have experienced greatly. Once I started sobriety, I stopped showing up to events as much. And that was a lot to do with not wanting to be around it, but also a lot to do with where I was. I didn't want to go. Like I said earlier, I'd reached a point before where I was reaching the weekend and, and saying, where are we going or what are we doing rather than what do I want to do? Now I ask myself that question and sometimes the answer is I don't want to go. So I don't. So my visibility, as it were, has diminished and that's okay. Do I get FOMO? A little bit, but it usually passes. I think before I started, there was an immense fear that I'd miss out, an immense fear that things would change, an immense fear that people would like me less. And maybe some of that is true. But stage three is about cultivating authenticity, learning to tolerate and reduce shame. I want to live authentically as myself. And I think going out because I want people to like me or going out because I have a fear that I'll miss out isn't being myself. It's allowing other things to control me. Mullen states that resolution on the crises that I mentioned earlier is about slow, measured, organic change. And so learning and making these small adaptions in my behavior is, is linked to that slow organic change. Things aren't going to change drastically. And if people don't like it, then and they shouldn't really be in my life. I think friends come and go and the ones that stay will stay because they love you, not stay because you went out loads or you validated them. In the chapter title for stage three, Alan quotes George Orwell saying, we have a hunger for something like authenticity but are easily satisfied by an ersatz for simile. And that's something I have to keep in mind, that I'm looking to achieve authenticity, I'm looking to cultivate authenticity, but it's easy to find something that feels the same and settle for that. It's obviously not an easy journey, but I'm tired almost of stage one and two. I'm tired of not telling people about certain hobbies because I'm afraid or I, I'm ashamed, really. I'm, I don't, I want to avoid that shame. For the longest time, I didn't tell people that I played video games. And if I did, I wouldn't tell them what video games because I didn't want them to judge me. 
I didn't tell people that I wrote poetry because I didn't want people to judge me. I thought that's all mamby pamby people will judge me. But I write poetry because I like it. I wrote poetry because it gets out those feelings that I can't get out in other any other way. I go to a support group every week and they talk about a higher power. It doesn't have to be any kind of religious higher power. It's up to you. And often I accredit my higher power to the ability to write down what I'm feeling in a lot of a better way than I can say it. I am able to more accurately describe how I'm feeling and find ways to relate to people in regards to how I'm feeling through poetry, which I can't do, or at least it feels like I can't do it in any other way. Stage three, Alan says, is a lot about ambiguity. He says that a lot of gay men who attempt to enter stage three, they foreclose on this ambiguity. They can't deal with the unknown. And so they make big life changes in order to stop that unknown from being unknown. He says, stage three begins for most gay men with a vague sense of freedom and vacillating awareness of confusion. Everything that feels that is familiar feels somewhat foreign and there is a growing awareness that life must be slowly redefined in all aspects. It is a time of shuffling that, much like a line of dominoes falling, starts with a small change and ends with radical difference. He briefly and anecdotally talks about Santa Fe in New Mexico, where a lot of gay men who are looking to enter stage three or are in stage three move to. Weirdly, it's this epicenter of, of gay men looking for a new lifestyle. And a lot of them arrive there seeking answers to lives that are no longer based on shame. Helen says that stage three is about hard won acceptance and their toxic shame cannot exist. It's about letting go of the fabulous, no matter how unglamorous that may be. Alan says stage three is akin to the archetype of the wanderer, the man who journeys from his home seeking something better, but not certain of what it is he might find. This is a period of life that is best described as a time of ongoing ambiguity. Thing is very clear or certain, except the ways that the ways of avoiding shame no longer interest him. For me, the ways of avoiding shame, they stopped being interesting to me like a light switch. There was just one night where things came to a head and I'd been broken up with and I felt like I'd been abandoned and I just decided I couldn't do it anymore. I decided that all of that stuff that came with going out and that came with drinking and that came with all other kinds of things. I just couldn't do any more. As I was reading this book, I was obviously making notes and in a somewhat infantile way, I wanted to write down a anagram for shame in order to kind of redefine it in my head. So I wrote down self-actualization harbors amazing mind-altering effects. Maybe that'll help someone, but I thought it was cute. Alan says that in stage three, rage dissipates along with its disguised expressions as authentic validation is achieved. And I think for me, I've said that rage isn't necessarily how it manifests, at least not in the typical definition of rage. I think for me, it, I, I close inwards when I'm angry or hurt. I don't, I hide away and I, I think that is a disguised expression of rage for me. And so as I am looking to achieve authentic validation, which I have felt, I since starting sobriety have had friends have very honest conversations with me where they are very kindly quite complimentary of me 
And it feels very validating because I feel like I'm making a choice that makes sense for me. And so for to have someone kind of congratulate you on that is, is nice. Helen says that the great danger inherent in stage three is that the gay man will foreclose on ambiguity rather than allow this lack of clarity to resolve itself naturally, like the settling white flakes in a child's snow globe when it has been put down. He attempts to create artificial clarity and too quickly defines an endpoint to his journey, where he turns back into the ways of earlier stages, being unwilling to tolerate the ambiguity of the present. And this is something people have warned me about. I hit six months about a week ago and I've said to people that six months feels real, but a year will feel really real. In my head, I visualize a year as a circle. So six months is a semicircle. And I think once that circle is complete, it'll really feel like sobriety is embedded. And people have kind of warned me and said a lot of the time, people put a year on a pedestal as this end point, this goal. And then they get there and they almost as a, as a celebratory gift to themselves, they blow it all away. And I said that to a friend, I said, if you're really going to think about quitting drinking, you have to say to yourself that you don't know when you will pick up another drink. For me, I don't think it will be ever. I've kind of given up drinking. It doesn't service me. I decided it's, I'm done. I'm done with all of it. And so there is no end point for me. But for him, if he really wants to take it seriously, I think, and for others, I think you have to end it without this idea that there is a point at which you'll be allowed to do it again. Alan says that the underlying psychological conflict that is resolved in stage three is the complete acceptance of the self and elimination of toxic shame. He no longer pushes away various parts of himself or hides his shortcomings among many lovers or within the sanctuary of his flawlessly designed home. He embraces it with hard-won acceptance. Here, toxic shame cannot exist. And obviously that is the goal. We as gay men, or at least me as a gay man, I have this insecurity of, of being gay and unlovable, you know. I'm okay with being gay, but what has kind of rooted in my upbringing as I've come to terms with being gay is this feeling that I have to make up for something. Someone in one of my support groups said that they had been told by their therapist that your sexuality is not a character flaw and that our souls have no sexuality or gender. I think that's a really beautiful way to put it. But essentially, I've lived with the idea that being gay is a character flaw and I've tried many ways to make up for it. I need to accept that I don't have a character flaw in regards to my sexuality and I need to kind of cultivate authenticity. Alan goes on to talk about relationships in regards to stage three and he says, in addition to being two wounded and struggling men, we didn't have the support that all new relationships need and that straight relationships almost always receive. There were no clergy to advise us on the importance of staying together. And weirdly, I had been writing kind of a book, not necessarily one that I would actually publish, but just kind of a book of my experiences dating as a gay man and kind of the underpinning thought that I'd come to as I was writing it that is that no one teaches young gay men the dangers of dating and there's no kind of rule book or guidebook out there of how to do it. There's no kind of guidebook on anything in regards to gay lifestyles that you have access to as an adolescent or that you are aware of and told about as an adolescent. So. You have to teach yourself about things like HIV and safe sex. And more than that, there's no talk about relationships and trauma and emotional 
baggage that comes with relationships and the damage that they can do. And I think in part that has to do with us being gay. There's just less stuff out there for gay life because it's relatively new in the grand scheme of things. But I think for gay men particularly, it's heavily related to the fact that we're men. At some point in the book, Alan talks about how everything that he's talking about is relevant to straight men too, really. He talks about how it is traumatic to grow up as a man in a hyper-masculine culture, but that that trauma is almost magnified and doubled when you're gay. Because from the get-go, you have committed the biggest transgression in, a, in that hyper-masculine culture, which is the desire of another man. Alan's discussion of, of relationships continues and he gets a bit Freudian here, which is maybe a criticism of the book, I'm not sure, but he talks about how our relationships with our parents are hugely relevant in regards to how we go on to have relationships. He is quite confronting and he says, ask yourself, was my father emotionally withdrawn? judgmental, physically abusive? If so, have your lovers been cut from the same fabric? The thread of relationships that Alan brings throughout the whole book is underpinned by a statement here. That first relationship for gay men ends in disaster. After that relationship fails and subsequent relationships thereafter, you begin to look at men differently. The seeds of cynicism and bitterness are planted deep in your heart. And ultimately, even as you move through the stages, the things that you experience begin to shape your view of future experiences of those things. He says that stage three is the time in a gay man's life when he begins to reflect on relationship trauma he has experienced. As the research on trauma grows, there is an increasing awareness on the very real effects of relationship trauma on a person. There is growing evidence that emotional memories rarely fade. Essentially, what he's getting at here is that relationship trauma is increasingly being accepted as a very real and present effect on people's biological processing of future emotions. He's talking about neuroscience here, where there's research that suggests that emotional memory may be forever and that emotional trauma, relationship trauma, sticks. And that growing cynicism that gay men have built from their first or con consecutive failed relationships is in part biological. I think for me, I've still now have nightmares or dreams where I'm reliving the relationship or I'm back with my ex and that what I have kind of come to realize as I was reading the book, that is reflective of the emotional trauma, the relationship trauma, the impact on me that I, up until kind of now, have been unwilling to accept. One of the key things that I've realized throughout my journey is that anything traumatic that happened to me, I was unwilling to accept that it had traumatized me or that it had had an impact on my emotions. I remember concretely thinking that I was lucky that I'd gotten away unscathed from certain traumatic things that had happened. Lynn says, the underlying dynamic of the acceptance in stage three is the realization that portrayal has a predictable and knowable cause, emotional woundedness. If we wish to have a relationship that is free of betrayal, that we must either find a partner who is not wounded or find a partner who is willingly and actively working on his own emotional wounds. Of course, the former is difficult, if not impossible, to find. The latter becomes the requirement of all gay men who wish to heal their relationship trauma. And I think this is a more detailed way of saying that if you aren't working yourself or if you don't love yourself, then you can't really love someone else. 
I went through an experience recently where I went on a couple of dates with a guy too. And I then went on holiday. And whilst I was on holiday, I probably wasn't messaging as much as I normally did. And that was likely in part due to being on holiday and taking a break. And he started to get insecure with me and, and said that I was pulling away and, and that I, that I was making him feel that I didn't want to be involved and kind of my reaction to that instantly was to be like, no, 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 I, I'm not pulling away. I didn't say that though, because I recognized that, that that's not truly what I thought. So I, I said to him, I'm not pulling away. I'm just busy. I'm just on holiday. Like once I get back, we can get back into the swing of things, but I'm on holiday. I need my time and space. Um, you can't expect me to be messaging every day all the time. And then he started to get weird with me, he started messaging less. And so I asked him if he was okay. And he said that he felt that if I was pulling away, that he should too. Or he essentially created a narrative where I was no longer interested in the relationship. And so he was no longer interested or he was pulling away. As I witnessed it, it was this kind of self damaging behavior. He was creating a story, believing it so much so that then he was making it real. And I recognized that this was his insecurity. And I went about my my holiday. I had posted some pictures to Instagram one where I felt like I looked good. And when I was flying back home, I landed and I messaged him and he responded in a very passive aggressive way as to imply that I had done something to him. I had disrespected him in some way. And so I asked him what, what had gone on and he long story short said that I had posted a thirst trap to my Instagram and then was replying to guys in the comments, um, which was disrespectful to him because we were dating or we were seeing each other. And I kind of reminded him of the fact that we had been on two dates. He had called it the honeymoon stage, which to me, just that is not how I saw it. And I communicated that to him. And once I gave myself the space to think about it, I went back with him and just said, you know what? I actually am very annoyed at what you've insinuated. You've implied that I've created or enacted some transgression against you, which I have not. And I don't feel guilty because I don't think I've done anything wrong. And what it came down to is that he felt that I should take on his insecurity as a boyfriend, even though that's not what we were. We had been on two dates, but he felt that I should take on his insecurity. And I wasn't harsh. I wasn't cruel. I just said, look, I can't do that. I've tried to do that in the past and it's not gone well for me. So unfortunately I can't progress with this this relationship like for me this is where it ends i'm happy to stay friends but i've seen a side of you that i don't personally believe that i could have a relationship with and ultimately that was because i could see someone that wasn't working on themselves or wasn't willing to work on themselves they were telling me that they were working on themselves but when i really dig down into it they had this emotional woundedness that they expected me to heal for them and Alan talks about a shift from the questions that we ask ourselves saying, shifting from what did I do to deserve this to how can I prevent this from happening again? And really what I was doing there that I recognize now, which I'm glad that I can have that kind of clarity is I recognized that with my ex, I had gotten into a situation where I felt like I deserved it. He was insecure and he was enacting his insecurity on me. I was taking on that burden. I'm sure I was doing the same to him. You know, I'm not, I'm not innocent, but I was taking on his burden. And because I had that experience, I am now asking myself, how can I prevent it from happening again? And so what I witnessed with this guy that I'd gone on two dates with was that it was happening again. And so I stopped it. Alan continues with the talk about relationships and he talks about accepting your accountability and responsibility in regards to 
betraying and hurting others. He states, the man who betrays in one circumstance is also the betrayed in another circumstance. Truth is, a gay man has likely been both betrayer and the betrayed in his relationships. He has both given and received of this vitriolic cocktail. And so that's what something that I have to accept. My past relationships were traumatic for me, but I'm also not just the victim. I have to accept and reconcile my role as both victim and perpetrator, at least to some extent. Alan says, we accept not only that the betrayal we experienced to resulted from other, another's wounds, but that the betrayal we perpetrate was the result of our own wounds. In conclusion to this stage three lens of relationships, Alan says, one gay man said to me, it would have been easier if he had hit me. At least then there would have been bruises as evidence of the injury. Instead, it was a slow drain on me that eventually destroyed my self-confidence. And that is a very relatable statement. I think I think back to who I was when I was 18, 19, before I had my first relationship. And I was very confident. And when I exited that relationship, I was not. I didn't have any way to show to people the damage it had done. I had to have multiple conversations with my mom about how my ex wasn't this great man that she thinks he was. She didn't think he was great, but she had this positive view of him that I had to change because it just wasn't reflective of the scars that I was holding. Alan also states, ambivalent relationships are as damaging as virtually any other form of physical or emotional abuse, sometimes even more so, because on the surface, the relationship may seem safe, but in reality, it is anything but. The backs and forths and ups and downs of these relationships slowly tax the gay man's emotional resources. I always remember thinking that relationships will work. You had to put in the work to, to get out of a relationship where you wanted. But as I read this book and as I reconcile my experiences, I think that's not true. I remember my, one of my favorite drag queens, Trixie Mattel, said once that relationships shouldn't be hard work. And she's obviously in a long-term relationship. I remember disagreeing with her at the time, but now I kind of recall that statement and accept that that's the truth. So for me, in the future, I'm not looking necessarily for a relationship now, but in the future, I want to embrace not having a relationship that is ambivalent and is up and down and hard work and hard to keep on top of and hard to keep on track. As I've recorded this episode, it has come out a lot longer than I expected. So I will end it here and make it a two-parter episode where next episode, I cover the key pillars of authenticity that Alan talks about, the questions to ask yourself that I've noted down, and then the life lessons and mantras that Alan goes over. Again, this won't be a comprehensive summary of everything that he talks about in the book. So f for that, read the book. It's called The Velvet Rage, Overcoming the Pain of Growing Up Gay in a Straight Man's World by Alan Downs. This has been Saying Something Sober, keeping me sober 192 days as of recording episode 2A.